Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to uh, record just myself talking about the class for today because for yesterday, the first class in environmental because we had so many technological difficulties and it kept breaking down. I think it would be easier for me just to summarize the class. I also think you can keep going back to the summary of the class and sort of decide, you know, see where we're at in terms of the class and how it all fits together. I usually, I will usually bring that up in the class because that's what I emphasize. Um, I want you to figure out how environmental issues go from the most immediate to the most profound uh, into the future. And so you have to figure out, you know, how to mold your character, how to mold your emotions, um, how, to, how to feel, how to think, how to live in relationship to environmental issues. There's many other issues in the world. Um, this one is particularly important. The thing about the environmental issues, especially in the US, is that there's a basic principle of reality, which is that what's most immediate is least important. And what's most important is least immediate. And to me, that's what it means to convert, to have a philosophical conversion experience. So in religion, people convert from, you know, focusing on temporal things to focusing on eternal things or something like that. Um, all the major religions have some sort of a turning around from Maya illusion to reality or from sin to grace. But in philosophy, my view is that you turn around from seeing with your eyeballs and cognition sort of organizing your experiences to understanding the underlying broader principles and causes. Those are least immediate, but they're the most important. The most, they have the most impact over time. So the fact that the stars in the universe move and change, but at a relatively slow uh, degree means the earth can circle around the sun for a long time. And the fact that it took a long time for life on earth to develop because it's all profoundly interconnected. Um, but that's what made it possible for us to evolve is because what was ordered was um, controlled what actually evolved, what, be, what was new. Um, now the big problem with environmental issues is that we've gotten to the point where he, we have disintegrated or crippled that natural process of going to higher and higher levels of complexity and maintaining a certain underlying order. So the underlying order is starting to erode. And so one of the big criticisms um, in the US was that climate scientists couldn't predict precisely you know, what was going to happen. Well, that's because everything is interconnected with everything else. And that's because we're destroying a lot of these underlying foundations for life on earth. But given that there's uh, a lot more uncertainty, we still have machines that can make general predictions. And we, every climate scientist knows that the more carbon we put in the air, the more we disintegrate the system. Um, so then we're having something of a race with technology, but we're never gonna win that race. We have to learn how to combine sustainability with technology that can uh, prevent the worst disasters. But there is a general agreement that if the overall temperature gets to a certain degree, everything is going to really seriously fall apart. So there's lots of debate about um, how warm the atmosphere is, how fast it's warming up, what we need to do to stop it, 
what's going to happen if it gets one degree more, two degrees more. Um, so, you know, in spite of all the variation that you see with your eyeballs, the other underlying things are what's most important. So that's a general principle. And that's also one thing you study in environmental ethics because uh, the way I teach it, you study the big picture things because it's on the basis of those big picture things that you develop your environmental ethic, that you make decisions about your own choices, about your way of life, about how you want to live both yourself as a married person, in an extended family, in a social culture, in a village or in a town, and then your country, and then the relation between the countries. All right, so um, I understand that you don't have much power. You have the most power over whether you're gonna waste water in the shower or something, but that's probably the least important. It's just important for your mind because everything you do affects how you think. So if people get up in the morning and take a half an hour long hot shower every day, they're gonna start questioning climate change, right? Because they don't wanna give up their habit and they know that it doesn't fit. So if people's habits are irrational enough and powerful enough and they don't wanna change them, they will, they will pollute their mind. They will deceive, delude, deny. So as a philosopher, the number one principle is that your mind is your greatest gift. You can say it comes from a creator God. You can say it comes from evolution. You can say it comes from, it is the only way we have to create positive karma rather than negative karma because we have to keep our minds in tune with the energy of the universe. You could say, you know, Lots of different ways of formulating that. But whatever else is true, a philosopher thinks your mind is your gift. And the worst corruptions of the mind are to think you know what you don't know or to think that you can manipulate the universe or the natural world in some way using your brain and come out okay. And that, I think, is truly evil um, because the goal, the reason why you can think at all is because the universe is ordered. And so having respect for that order, honoring that order, trying to understand it and choosing to live in a way that's in harmony with it to the greatest extent possible is really anything less than that is truly a corruption of your mind. Um, so that's, in general, what I would like to, to set out as the starting point for environmental ethics. We have minds, we should use them. Um, and if we don't, we are going to self-destruct. And every, it'll destroy everything that makes life worth living. And to, at this point, it might destroy life. So um, shouldn't be taken lightly. All right, now I did figure out how to do what I used to do. So this is going to be much easier than uh, the gymnastics that we went through last time. So here is the syllabus. Um, I'm a, yeah, that's the time of the class. And then I have office hours. I have another class. Tuesday, Thursday at the same time. No, Sunday, Tuesday at the same time. So I thought I'd keep my office hours at the same time um, on Thursday and Friday. But if Friday is your holy day and you don't have classes, I'm not sure. That's okay. I don't want to be disrespectful to anyone. And we can always create another time. I want you to think that I am available for you 
because there's two reasons. The nature of the subject matter, the way I teach philosophy is that you can read things, but where you really start learning something that becomes part of who you are is when you talk about it. And you talk, because when you talk about it with another person, your character is revealed. Your emotions, your hopes, your fears um, are connected to your thoughts. And so I like to engage with students in conversations about serious topics. Um, so that's one reason why I'm available. Another reason I'm available is that I'm older. I have published enough. I have pleased enough people. So I don't have to worry about my career. Uh, the younger professors are still having to prove themselves. They have, they have way more work than I do. Um, and, and that's another reason I want to make myself accessible. And finally, I guess there's a third reason. I do know the history. And I do think as a humanities person, knowing the history of a problem that's in front of your face helps you understand why. And then it can help you understand what to do next or sort of anticipate what's going to happen. So there's many reasons why I want to make myself available. I know that many of you are incredibly busy and you have other things to do and it's no problem. I'm not offended. <laughs> I'm just available if you would like to discuss the material. Okay. Finally, I do know that um, I, I can't get you a job. I can't send you to grad school. I, all I can do is uh, talk to you about life and how to live and how you want to live moving forward. So that's the liberal arts part of the education. Um, you may, I encourage you to attach some of the lessons in this class to the other classes that you're taking. So I really would like you if if it makes sense to you, I never want to force you, but if there's something you're taking in another class that links to something in this class, if you put it in your post or you talk to me in a, in a conference, the next time I teach the class, I can tell the students, oh, if you take uh, Dr. So-and-so's this class, You'll find there's a connection here. And I really like weaving the classes together. I taught at a, I've always taught at small liberal arts colleges. I attended small liberal arts colleges. I'm one of very, very few academics that even in my PhD program, I was in a small liberal arts college. And the, the advantage of those kinds of institutions is that you have dialogue and you can develop a curriculum that is woven together. So my goal is that you would have classes that are like puzzles. So there's a puzzle piece and there's certain lectures that link together, but then each class has its own content, just like each puzzle piece has its own content. But if you put them all together, the picture, the whole is much greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so the more those parts go together, the more you can get this big picture of what your education has been. So when you leave, not only are you prepared to move forward in a specific job or a specific grad school, but you have this whole worldview you have this puzzle, this round puzzle that is a world that includes not just the academic part of your class, but also the organizations, the relationships, all those things together make for a whole that's much greater than the sum of the parts. And so I want to I want to contribute as much as I can to that particular educational philosophy and educational institutional
process. All right, um, that's my email. You can also um, contact me at my lion.edu email. That's the one, I'm always on that one, but I'm actually going to be on this one a lot more than I was before. But if you really want to catch me immediately, you could try martha.beck at lyon.edu. Um, and I'll put that in the syllabus after we're done. All right, my qualifications. Um, in general, my study of ancient Greek philosophy, I started it because of environmental issues. I think that is important. I was very concerned about environmental issues starting in 1968, which is a, what, 30, uh, 53 years ago. And in the US, there were people who knew this was going to be a huge problem, but nobody listened. And greed, the desire for profit, won out over the green, the environmental movement, much to everyone's detriment, I think. But I'll talk about that more when we go through the summary of the class. Anyway, my main, the point here is that most of what I do is Greek philosophy and one part of the puzzle piece of Greek philosophy is environmental sustainability, creating a culture that's sustainable and that the citizens are educated to avoid pride and avoid greed. And then they will be motivated to develop a sustainable culture. So I have um, published directly and indirectly on those issues for decades, basically. Um, my goal is to get all the readings onto um, the Google Classroom. So I'll just put them on each, each day, just like today. You have uh, a stream, an assignment. I'll explain that assignment. I'll post all the attachments. I have to go scan a lot of books and articles um, and I'll post them. And then I will create an assignment and will, there will be an announcement on the stream that I have created an assignment. And then you will do your posts, which I will explain in just a minute. I wrote a very long course uh, objectives and description. Um, I told a long story. I might get in trouble for that, but <laughs> that was what I did at like 3.30 in the morning yesterday and hope, hope that's all right. Um, okay, so here we go on the, on the basic outcomes. So the outcomes are the skills you need to move on professionally. And so uh, there are two, right? There are lots of different ways that I need to connect to you. I can connect to you in terms of what's on your mind. How do you think about these issues? I can connect to you. How do you wanna live? How do you wanna organize your life connected to these issues? And then I represent AUW, the institution has to satisfy many different outside evaluators and we have to be rigorous. We have to um, show that we are teaching our students all of these things on the left-hand column. Um, I can't just be a nice lady, which I'd like to do, but also I think I'd rather be your teacher because I do want to give you these skills, even if I can't make you happy all the time when I grade you, I do want you to develop these kind of skills. And nobody, nobody uh, does that except a teacher or maybe a boss, right? And friends tend not to do that. Family members tend not to do these things. So I'm going to do these things. All right. So Every day we have what I have you on Google Classroom and I make the 
the announcement that I've opened up an assignment and you do a post for every day of class. Now, I think there are something like 18 classes. You only have to do 14. So you can skip a few, or if you want to do every one or more than 14, I will knock out your lowest grade so that it'll be the 14 highest uh, grades that you got on your post, I will average that and that'll be 50% of your final grade. But those posts include, um, they develop your inquiry and analysis. So um, I'll talk about them more specifically in a minute. But these are all the things I want you to look for. I think I have a real advantage teaching philosophy because the way I teach it, I have no idea how the students are going to process the material or what they're going to learn. And I don't want to control what they're going to learn. I want each student to be different, each student's papers to be different. Because, I, because if the student is truly engaged, they've linked it to their life, it's bound to be different. I will also ask you, after you write each paper, and there's three papers, to present your results, either to the whole class or in your small groups, so that you can all appreciate each other's minds. So you can have a a dialogue between minds and you can inspire each other. You can learn to respect and honor each other, but you can also help each other, right? The critical thinking is when you read it and you go, well, what do I think of this? And then you try to communicate that to people in your group and they tell you, well, you're not communicating or they, they do follow-up questions, and then you post things and I will write things on it to try to stimulate your critical thinking skills. So you're constantly examining and re-examining your own mind, your own way of making sense of the material, and um, that's how we do it in this class. I think it's different than other classes because the teacher, there's no outside objective observer. There's no detached observer. All of us are engaged citizens when it comes to environmental issues. We all have skin in the game. We all, our lives are gonna be affected. So there's no such thing as just saying, well, two plus two is four, you know? There's no values in that. Everything we read, the facts, imply a set of values. There's no detached facts. Um, so that's why I have an advantage is that everything is, everything requires inquiry analysis and critical thinking. So you have these three written assignments that are in addition to the posts and I will put those on the stream. So your final paper is my environmental ethic. What is my view? And each day at the end of the class, you have to write down what is the one thing, the two, one, two or three main things that I learned from this class and this material that I either do want it to include in my final paper or I don't want to include it. I might want to include it because I really don't like it, but I think it's been influential. I want to include it because it's important, not because I agree with it. Um, or something, you know, it's all up to you, but each day at the end in your final summary, you write down, do I think I'm going to include this or not and why? All right, so 
about one third of the way into the class. And so it's not after seven weeks, it's approximately after uh, three weeks. I have the dates on down, further down. You write a shorter essay that is just your reaction to the lectures about the Western Enlightenment and how it, it set up a number of worldviews that are all detrimental to the environment. They all presuppose the value of exploiting nature for human well-being. And they even labeled it with God's will, okay? So at your first paper, we're gonna get to that point in the class where we've studied that. And then you write about your reaction to that. Is that influencing you and your society? Okay, let me just give an example. Um, last year when I taught this class, um, or it might have been, yeah, it was this class. There was a student who said, the students start realizing that the utilitarian philosophy, which I will describe, the utilitarian view of happiness really has affected them or their families. And now they can see it in this context of environmental destruction. So they realize that it really has made them blind to the way their countries are being exploited and the way environmental problems are increasing. In other words, they're happening, but we're not paying attention because we've been so influenced by this Western thinking, this Western enlightenment thinking. And so this one girl said that her family is all short of stature and they don't have a lot of money, but her brother became so obsessed with wanting to be taller that he went and bought all this stuff that I think American corporations are trying to sell, right? And they can sell it online. And so he's just, he got totally brainwashed into it and it's affecting their family finances, but it affects our ignorance of environmental problems because we're so focused on this other stuff. So that is your first paper will be related to the influence of the history behind um, environmental issues. And I hope, you know, that you'll start to understand why I think understanding history is important. I'm sure that you know the history of your countries well enough to know that it's hard to know what's going on today in your country unless you know the history behind it. So this is the same as true with environment. So that'll be the first essay. Then I do want you to write a research. The first essay, you do not have to have any sources outside of class materials. The second essay is a research paper. It's not long, but you have to have three sources. And that one is where you pick a certain topic uh, related to environmental issues. And there are plenty of them. And then you just explore it further. I would recommend that you look at that issue in relation to your country because you that's your country, right? It affects you, your family. Um, I don't think AUW's goal is to pull you out of these countries and send you somewhere else like a brain drain. I think they want you to eventually go back and help your people. That's why you got the scholarships, whatever, but that's, that's hard. And so I would imagine you need to spend time away to get professional expertise. Um, there's a lot of experience that you would need and things like that, but eventually, to go back or to at least know your country's situation so you can bring it up in these other contexts. For example, I spent two separate semesters teaching in Indonesia. And um, I learned among other things, Indonesia's entire history is about people coming there to exploit their natural resources. It's really sad <laughs> and um, so you have Confucianism. Indonesia is a multi-faith 
uh, country. And that's why. <laughs> so the Chinese come and they bring their Confucianism and the people from India come and they bring their Hinduism and their Buddhism. And uh, the, the people from the Mideast come and they bring their Islam. The Dutch come and they bring their Protestantism. The Portuguese come to exploit human resources and they bring their Catholicism, but all of it was motivated by money and natural resources. So they are losing in the last 20 years, they've lost 40% of their forests. So somebody from Indonesia really might wanna write about the loss of species or deforestation or something, you know, very specific to what's going on in their country. That, so that's what I would like you to do with that essay, that research paper. Then you can also, when we present in class, you can obviously inform each other about what's going on in your country, but also in your area of the world, Southeast Asia, and there's Afghanistan, Pakistan. And I honestly know that each of you is authentically interested in what goes on in, in these other countries. So basically, I tell you what goes on in my country, not because I'm so proud of my country, but because it has this impact. And then each of you can tell, find out and tell each other and me what's going on in your country. So, and then the final paper is your environmental ethic. What you wanna take with you is kind of your manifesto about, um, about um, environmental issues. All right, so that's written communication. So I will try to work with you on your English. Um, that's why I require that you meet in a conference with me before you finish the final draft. So you can come with just an outline or you can come with a draft. I think I've got too many students to be able to read over the final, the rough drafts. I think I have something like 50 students in two classes. So that, I used to do that, but that's not going to work. So you will need just an outline and then you will have to, you know, be working on your English. You can go to the writing center, it's open. If you wanna go there and work with people on just the prose and the topic sentences and things like that. But I can work with you on the outline and whether it looks like each paragraph is going to have a separate topic um, and how them, they all fit together. All right, oral communication. Every two weeks or so, approximately, I'll ask you to give more formal presentations in your groups. I have a four-part rubric. And then you can, again, dialogue with each other about the quality of your presentation. So in a job setting, it would be like the difference between going to a meeting and having a discussion about some issue, which is what we do when students just present in, in, informally, and having you have a formal presentation you have to give to a group of people for your job. And so that would be what that oral presentation is. Um, the readings, I try to have readings that are not filled with professional jargon. And there's a lot of that in my profession, which makes me very angry uh, because I think that's part of colonialism, maintaining colonialism, because that gives me power because I can give you these articles that even that very few native English speakers would even be able to understand. And, but you have to jump through that hoop to get this degree. And I just think that's colonialism. I don't think there's any reason why you have to have difficult words and it has to be complicated in order to understand the issue. The issues are complicated, but you can explain them in a way that's just one piece at a time, like a puzzle, and so that a broader range of people can actually understand it. 
and academics, professionals who sit in their offices and write articles that their audience is 10 other people. I, I want to avoid assigning those kind of articles. Uh, we shall see. Or if I think I need to because of the subject, I'll try not to assign a lot of pages. I would like you to write in your post how much time you spent on the assignment, the reading and the writing of the post, uh, because I want some sort of ballpark figure of whether I'm demanding too much of you or too little of you. Now, because the semester is so condensed and there's three hours of classes, that means I can technically assign six hours of homework each day. Um, and I, I doubt that it's going to be that. But I'll try to aim for three or four, which is, again, a lot less than the standard two hours per hour of class. But I want to know some students probably will get through it in two hours. But if other students, it really honestly takes them six hours. I need to sort of balance that out and see if most of the students, most of the time, can do it within four hours max, right? Average. So that's um, that's my philosophy, or those are my principles behind how I assign things. Um, information literacy is the research paper where you learn how to handle information. Teamwork is when you're working in your small groups. And I think generally you don't have a final project, but you do have the teamwork of engaging each other with your mind and educating each other and getting to a higher place collectively. Intercultural knowledge is obviously, and you know, this is huge intercultural and international issue. And then the skills. So I want you to have skills, not just for lifelong learning, which would be the reading and the writing and the critical thinking, but also skills for lifelong living, right? How do you attach your intellectual skills to your moral character and your way of life? Um, all right, attendance is required. Um, most of your notebook grades are based on your reflection. So each post, this is where I want to explain the posts. Each week, each day, you come. Uh, I don't want your notes on all of the material. You can keep those in some separate place. But in your official post, I will, I will be more specific at certain points, but in general, I want you to write down three points from the reading that you want to bring up in your small group. Something that, if necessary, confused you, but something that you thought was surprising or important or um, was connected to something else that you didn't realize, these are connected just something that you thought you really want to talk to the other people in the group about. Okay, three things. Then we had this engagement during the class, uh, small groups, we have me talking, and I probably will talk more than I wish I did, but it's hard to gauge how well the small groups are going. I will ask for feedback on that periodically. I will also try on the one hand to keep you in the same group for a certain amount of time so you can get to know each other's characters and interests. But on the other hand, sometimes some groups work better than others. And if you're in one that isn't seeming to work, then you don't want to get stuck that um, for a long time that way. So if you feel like your group is not working for some reason, you can send me a separate email and um, I can, you'll have to sort of give me the names of the people in the group. And then when we have a breakout session the next time, uh, I'm not sure I can get everybody in the same group day after day, but if I can, I'll try. If I can't and a group is, 
I'll, then we're just going to have different people each time. Uh, but I'll try to make it so that nobody gets a group where perhaps the electricity is going down, perhaps somebody's really not that interested. I just want you to be able to be engaged during the whole three hours in some meaningful way. Then I do have a handout that explains the difference between A, B, C, and D uh, posts. Oh, then at the end of each post, so there's what you came before class. Then after the class, you write three things that you really learned during the class from other students or from me. You know, I prefer other students, but it has to be the things you learned the most. And also you write your final reflection. What is my takeaway from this day for my final environmental ethic? Okay, so that's what the posts are. They'll start out with um, the first day of class. I would only require you about um, maybe, I don't know, 400 words. It's just that they're gonna get longer. So I wanna be able to grade them sort of each one counts the same. So the first one can't be too short because it won't compare to the later ones. But it, it, the, the minimum number of words is going to go up. Um, but hopefully you can write a lot more. If you start to making the connections, um, I don't mind if you write more. You can always write more than I require because I'm perfectly happy to read it. And if your mind is starting to make a lot of connections, then you would want to write that down, as long as you show me the connections. Um, again, because I have so many students, I'm probably not gonna take as much time on it as I might want to. If your English is um, not good, I will literally just rewrite paragraphs. And the way, the way I do the writing part is I don't say to you, you know, you have a run on sentence or you have a dangling participle or something like that. I do it the way people, the way children learn how to live. They learn by imitating. And so I, I wanna sort of set the model and show you and just ask you, or, or you can think about did she say basically the same thing I said, but it was clearer and it was shorter? And then if that's true, well, how did she do that? Like, how could I do that next time? And if you study that, right? Just like when you study somebody else's behavior, right? You start to imitate that and you start to develop just a voice, just an ability to hear yourself or to see that that sentence is too long or to see that, you know, the reference for the word you or the her, you know, you can't tell what the her refers to. I don't wanna give it a name so much. I just wanna show you. And um, I have written a lot and my first drafts are no good because I'm in love with my ideas and I just sit there and type and it just runs on like crazy. And then when I go back to it, I get mad at myself because it's really hard to revise it once I've done that. Because every time I read it, I get back into my mind again and I forget that this is really hard for an outsider to follow. So uh, that's how I do the writing, correcting your writing. Sometimes I just do real specific things, but other times I'll just rewrite a whole paragraph to see if you can sort of learn by imitation. A lot of writing is reading things that are well-written. So again, I want to try to assign things that would be the kind of thing that you would read and write after you graduate. It's not jargon. It's not topics that you're never going to see again. So that's what I'll, if you just practice reading good prose, and then writing prose and getting some direction from me. It just takes practice. And I apologize that again, the, the use of English as the international language 
for getting ahead in the world is another kind of colonialism. It's another kind of power issue. And I know that, but I also know you won't get anything unless you do learn English. So I'm not necessarily happy about that. But I happen to have born in, been born in a country where English is my native language. So I do have an ability, not due to anything I chose, but I do have that ability to help you out just for that reason. Um, and I will do that as much as I have time to do. Um, I think the number of minimum words is gonna start out higher than 200. It's gonna start out at 400 and go up, okay? Um, you can email me. The time difference means there's about a window of about four hours there, but we can work it out. All right, so that's the first section of the lecture for today. Now, the second section, I'll be talking specifically about the readings, and I just want to explain to you how they interact. Like, what, what's the big picture here for why I assign the things I assign, how they're related to each other, and um, so you get an idea, right? So I'm explaining to you, this puzzle is a world map, even though all you have are the pieces. This is the picture of what it's supposed to look like, you know, when you buy a puzzle, right? Usually the picture is up there so that when you look at a piece, you can feel, oh yeah, okay, that goes there. So every time you read a new reading, you can remember, oh yeah, I remember where that piece went, you know, and why she's assigning this today. So that's the idea. Um, the first section is paradigm shifts, and we will go over that attachment in a minute. And colonialism and post-colonialism, Aristotle's model of flourishing, and how that relates to environmental ethics. So I will give you the model that um, I, this is the foundation for the way I live. And ever since 1968, I have tried to be conscientious about environmental things. I'm not, I'm not super conscientious though, but I don't think that you or myself should become so obsessive about not using water or not adding carbon that you cripple yourself, right? So I flew to Greece 18 times every summer. I go to Greece to study Greek culture. Once I get there, I don't use a car, but that there's a carbon footprint there. It's just that I balance out the carbon cost to the benefit that I can actually have my career and that my career is about sustainable culture. And I do want you to not, don't hinder yourself in your ability to achieve just because it's gonna be, it's gonna require a higher carbon footprint. That is the way, once again, the society before your time structured careers that way and it's not your fault and you don't have to take responsibility. I think your main responsibility is to find out what you're good at, get the credentials, and then do it well. Do it for the well-being of other people. And try to do the, all of that with a minimal carbon footprint, but without obsessing, without crippling yourself in that process. Um, OK, so another reason Aristotle's model. So I was actually thinking this way before I ever read Aristotle. And then I read it. I was like, yeah, okay, I get that. And now, recently, a book came out from Oxford Press talking about the virtues of sustainability. And it just shows how Aristotle's theory of the virtues are very consistent with sustainable living. And the United Nations now has developed a curriculum for educating children uh, to, to have the right habits, sustainable habits. And it turns out, probably without them knowing it, I don't know how many of them knew Aristotle's virtues, but it turns out they're very compatible. 
And so that is, that's definitely the direction that I would go personally. So this course does have a bias that way, but it's very much open to other students' worldviews and points of view. Um, I call this view uh, spiritual humanism rather than modern secular humanism. And I can explain to you why. You'll probably understand that just after I go over the outline for a while. But anyway, so um, I will go through that again because we did do some of that in the first class and I will do that. The, then we have um, what, one, two, three, four, uh, four and a half lectures basically about the Western scientific and industrial revolution and the enlightenment culture that emerged. By culture, I mean the set of values, the way people were uh, uh, habituated, the institutions that were set up, that's the culture, right? Science just gives you knowledge, it gives you tools, but somebody else has to work on how to create a culture, a set of values, a worldview, and all the institutions necessary to reinforce that. So uh, the first step is Francis Bacon's new organon. So, Aristotle was the old organon works. Francis says, forget Aristotle, we're gonna do it this way. So he throws it out very deliberately. He makes the move from wisdom to science. He makes the move from understanding the natural world to exploiting the natural world for human well-being. Um, and that's just absolute, nobody can question that whether it was good or bad, whatever, it was done and it influenced everything. Then we have John Locke. John Locke is the precursor to any sort of language you use about rights. So John Locke has a theory of natural rights. And so we will cover that because you do know that that's influential. People use rights language all the time. So I give you the foundation of that language and, and some of the real problems with that language, especially when it comes to property and property rights. And so if you want to know why the United States has all the climate scientists or, you know, way more climate scientists, way more climate research, all sorts of stuff. And it also has all these people who deny climate science and who keep exploiting the natural world. And it's because of our view of property rights. So I'm not gonna elaborate on that. You just have to take my word for it and we will cover it in the very next class. Okay, then the other, there's three different major models of the notion of human reason that dominated during the Western Enlightenment. All three of them, um, and then there's Karl Marx's critique of John Locke, and then there was Christianity's take on it during the Enlightenment. But the three major models of reason are all dedicated <laughs> to exploiting nature indefinitely for human well-being. Okay, so the second one is utilitarianism. This is the courses you take. You can think about the courses you take. How many of them are based on uh, modern scientific reasoning where research means collecting data and drawing an inference, right? Um, so, you might ask, well, what the heck, what else is there? <laughs> well, there's that bigger picture. Like this is very small picture most of the time. And the philosophy behind that kind of research is that we don't have any values. Facts are very different from values. So you can study how to exploit, um, how to use lumber to make paper 
but that doesn't carry with it any value about how much lumber are we going to cut down, right? The bigger picture is deforestation. But that modern science, modern scientific method does not include that. I think a lot of your classes, when I look at the names of the classes, they do have values sort of implicit or explicitly um, woven into your, what you're studying. But there are plenty of people, most people in the US who are trained scientists and use scientific method are hired by corporations to help the corporations make money or they're hired by the US military to help us make better bombs and weapons. So, so the, the method itself is value free um, and it can be used for good or evil. But, but what you need to know is let's look at the origins of it. Let's look at it. Let's look at what they thought it was going to do. So the people at the time really thought they would completely change human nature and the human condition, and they could get to the point where there's no more human suffering, except that, you know, death or some standard stuff, or if people mistreat each other. But in general, social science could condition people to be virtuous, and natural science would provide housing and healthcare and education, and we could all be one big happy, okay? <laughs> And I do want you to understand their thinking. So I'm going to try and convince you that I'm right. I, I like to dress up like these people and pretend I'm them and give you an argument for why I know I'm right. <laughs> and then you have to figure out hmm, what went wrong, right? Um, so I'm not sure how much of that I'll do. I used to do that at my and I would get costumes and everything. But I really think liberal education, if you really want to liberate your mind and your imagination, you really have to understand people from their point of view, no matter how much you might disagree. I even actually, when I cover this, I'll pretend I'm Donald Trump, okay? And I'll have an argument with John Stuart Mill about who's the better citizen, okay? Uh, just, just to shake you up, right? What the heck is Trump thinking? I know what he's thinking. <laughs> I wish I didn't know, but I do, so. Um, all right, so we have utilitarianism. You treat human beings, they are a kind of animal. So this is a view that accepts evolution, but it's reductionist evolution. Aristotle's view also accepted evolution, but it claimed that at a certain point, evolution got complicated enough and our brains got complicated enough that we actually are driven by ideas and we're driven by the idea of the good or God. And we can rewire our brains according to our idea of the big picture of the place of the human species in the universe. That is not what happened with this view of evolution. When evolution emerged in the modern world, it was connected to the view that let's just get real, people are like herd animals and you have to stimulate them, right? You have to provide pleasure, pain, incentives, disincentives, positive and negative reinforcement. And if you do that, you can control people and they will behave. So you do have to, we are gonna go over that because it's been very influential I don't know how influential it is in your countries, which is what I want to know, but I can tell you how influential it is in my country because I know, or I know more than you do probably because I've been in the culture. Now, another big issue is the relationship between treating people like herd animals to mold their behavior and valuing freedom, right? We're supposed to be the free and open society that values freedom above all else. Well, how do they actually put those together? So we'll talk about that. We have um, Locke, Kant, 
con oh, sorry. Um, and then we'll talk about utilitarian and animal rights. Okay, the other major view of reason, we have rights language, we have utilitarianism, and then we have Kant dualism. So modern rationalism is um, dualism. Kant thinks our reason is innate and it's not natural. It's based on principles. So nature is based on um, pleasure and pain, uh, observation, but human behavior and human science is based on principles that we develop in our heads and we impose them onto the world. So that's a very different view of human nature, the human condition, and then how you wanna live, good and evil. Um, so rights language, uh, innate, innate reasoning that's not connected, that imposes itself, and then uh, thinking that is actually just an extension of ourself as a sophisticated animal, thinking that's driven by pleasure and pain, just like the other animals. So all of those three are different models of reason. All of them are substantially different from Aristotle's model. Then you have Karl Marx, and he criticizes the Enlightenment, especially John Locke, rights language because rights language was what drove capitalism. So Karl Marx has a raving critique of capitalism. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. I think a number of you have countries that have had communist movements, so including Bangladesh. And so again, I assume you probably know things. I don't wanna talk down to you about it. I just wanna show everybody the underlying philosophy and how these things all link together. Now, the thing about this, even though Marx was very critical, he accepted exploitation of nature for human well being. All four of them, no matter how much they criticize each other, they all <laughs> destroyed the environment in the name of the good, either God's will or human flourishing, whatever. But it was all presupposing indefinite exploitation. And so we've come to the end of where that worldview is uh, helpful, right? It's now becoming self-destructive. The next section, this is where you, you write your papers on your thoughts about the Western enlightenment, the impact of science, industry, and technology. Technology is just another extension of this. Um, okay, then the next section of the class is about um, what are called religions, be, but that was part of the Western colonialism, was to label Hinduism a religion or Buddhist a religion. They weren't religions. The people thought they were just a way of life. And so they are sustainable ways of life, actually. So when we get into the religions, um, the first person article criticizes Christianity in the book of Genesis as the cause behind environmental destruction because supposedly God gave Adam uh, the power to name the animals and to fill the earth and subdue it or master it or however you translate. And there are many people in the United States who feel like God intended for us to exploit nature, even if it looks like we're gonna destroy the creation, that's God's will, because God has a plan for the end of history. And like to me, that's very suspicious when the punchline is now I can drive my big gas guzzling truck and live in my big gas guzzling house, you know? That seems like an ulterior motive to me. And I, I think it's the ultimate evil personally. And I've thought that since 1968. It's just really horrible to me to watch people deceiving themselves, deluding themselves, denying things, and to think that God would want us to destroy the creation. It just blows me away. Um, so I hope most of you aren't on board with that. <laughs> I think most of you are not. Uh, but Time will go on, uh, time will tell. So I have one article on envir Islamic environmental ethics, 
but, and I have one article on Hindu, Buddhist, Confucian, pagan, and secular, then I have a secular one down here, the, the land ethic. But what I would like each of you to do is to pick one of these, whatever you identify with. And so if you identify as Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or Confucian or pagan or just secular humanist and go find some article, one article that and report on it that day that we cover it in class. So when we're covering Islamic environmental ethics, I would like all the students who identify Muslim to um, report in on what they found, what article they found, or, or what particular author or something, right? It might be a particular issue. So it could be the Muslim um, position on uh, climate change, the Muslim position on uh, biodiversity, the women, something like that. So keep that in mind. You can even start looking those things up if you like. Uh, this is a case where I certainly would love every student to be able to report into the big class. And it, there might be time enough to do that. I think we probably have a majority Muslim students. So what would happen is maybe half of them would report on the 14th and we would start the next class with them finishing up and then the students that identify Hindu or Buddhist. It will really depend upon how many students we have uh, who identify with which tradition, which is something I really like about AUW. I also had a student last year and we, we read an, uh, a dialogue where Socrates is talking to a, a religious leader who's pretty arrogant. And she said, I hate clerics, okay? She was from Afghanistan. She'd been in a demonstration against the Taliban and she almost got killed. So she is a raving secular humanist, right? Oh, AUW needs some of those. And so I hope we can get a huge variety. Um, I would imagine the majority are Muslim, but I, they, they also are very tolerant, accepting and curious about the other students. And we really need some raving secular humanists here. I hope I can cough up a few of you. Um, so anyway, that's the second section of the class. Um, I don't have you writing another paper on that, but this might be the point at which you might want to start thinking about your research paper. Do you want, do you want to do research on Islamic environmental ethics? Um, we are going to do one of those makeup days because the holiday at, toward the end of the period has um, two days missed for this class and only one day for my other class. So I am going to ask you to make that up and we can take a vote on which day. Um, again, if you absolutely can't come, we always have the Zoom. So when there are days that you can't come or your electricity goes down, having the Zoom and then having the posts means that you only, you know, you missed maybe 20% of the class that comes from talking to each other, but that's all right. I do think you missed something. So I do require you to come, um, but I don't think you miss so much that you feel lost, I think definitely you can be completely engaged in the class. Um, and then starting June 28th, the readings will be shorter. Now we're gonna move into specific issues. Why is the um, death of so many species, right? The extinction of species, why is that important? And we'll have one reading, but then you can go and explore specific cases in your country of how, many, how much species loss is going on in your country. Um, why is overpopulation an issue? And the tragedy, the commons, too many people are using, um, okay, the commons would be, for example, there's a pasture um, for grazing and four farmers have four cows. And as long as they have four cows, the grass can replenish itself. 
Well, then a farmer says, you know, if I had two cows, I'd, I'd be a lot richer. So then everybody has two cows and three cows and pretty soon the pasture dies out. There's no pasture left and no, everybody starves. So that's the tragedy of the commons. And so that's a problem. Um, and you can, again, you can find countries, uh, issues in your country where the, the tragedy of the commons is playing out. Too many people are farming certain land and it's becoming less productive. But some farmland is just because of floods uh, or, and drainage or erosion. And, but that would make the tragedy of the commons worse because it gets smaller, the amount of land that can actually be used. Anyway, so that's that day. Then your research paper is due. Um, and I don't, um, I'm not gonna grade you down if you hand it in later. You can hand, because I want you to balance out your requirements in different classes. And you can put my class on the back burner, somewhat back burner. But again, I have too many students to say you can hand it all in, uh, you know, at the end or something. It's just, that's not gonna work. So you could hand it in a week or two late, which is a week late, up to a week late, which is two weeks <laughs> or a week and a half, 10 days normal time. So. You can hand it in later um, and I won't grade it down. Okay. Lifeboat ethics is the idea that I grew up in a developing country. I'm on the lifeboat. How many people in developed countries, developing countries, so I grew up in a developed country. How many of those people out there do we let in the lifeboat? I mean, you can't let them all in or the boat will sink. So, you know, how many of you am I going to, you know, so that's the issue. And the guy argues for a pretty fascist, right? Environmental fascist point of view. Okay, the answer to that has a lot to do with providing women with opportunity, with education, and then women understand that the future of their children is in getting educated and healthcare. Then they can know that their children won't die and they can know that they need to have way fewer children in order for their children to be able to be successful. And so the best way to cut down on overpopulation is to educate women. And so Bangladesh has been at the forefront of this sort of philosophy. And I read about this 40 years ago or more because I had it pictured in my mind um, because I was thinking of not having kids. I was really into zero, zero population growth. Um, so, I mean, none of my children were planned, which I don't like to announce to the world, but I'm really glad I had them. My life would be way worse. Um, but I, I was really serious about zero population growth. Um, and I think the philosophy of trying to educate women as the best way to deal with a problem, I completely agree with that. And again, it's another reason I'm part of the AUW community. Um, food supply, right? I am a vegetarian, but I wasn't when my children were growing up because I think I had to make sure my kids, you know, I still am not enough of a well-educated vegetarian to make sure they would get all the amino acids that, that some of them you need supplements or you need to be really conscientious about eating legumes or something. And for growing children, I didn't want to have to uh, think I made a mistake. Like a lot of that is le not legitimate, but I was cowed into not forcing it. Plus, I didn't want my kids to be self-conscious. And I think you can develop hangups about food. So there are kids in the US probably if they were raised vegetarian, they're so mad at their parents for not letting them fit in that they like become, you know, huge meat eaters as adults, just as a reaction. So, but I do think you need to know about the harm done by meat production. Uh, again, the cattle raising in the US because of factory farms is way worse and way more higher, way higher carbon footprint than it is in 
lots of locations in the developing countries, it's still a problem. So climate change and then free market capitalism, advertising, all that stuff. And then the problem of ecological justice and the way the West tries to deceive people in developing countries into believing that they can just catch up because it's not gonna happen. Uh, life on earth will end before they'll ever catch up. So, all right. And then the last day of class, you present your outlines of your final papers. So that would be another formal presentation. There are the requirements. Um, these are the due dates and the weight. The posts count for 50%, the other three papers together count for 50%. In general, I will weigh the first paper less, lower, but sometimes a student runs out of time at the end um, and they don't do as well as they really, their posts sort of show that they've been learning, but somehow they couldn't do their best job on the, on the final paper. So I'll try to weigh that in and be fair about that. Plagiarism, um, dishonesty, I've never, okay, so my key there is I did have a student and we were covering some material, maybe on Plato or something, and the post had things about Plato that we didn't cover in class. So they really did look like they were lifted from some site somewhere else. So I don't want to actually chase you down that much. So what I do is, the rule is, your posts need to be focused on the material in the class. And then you're not going to be able to plagiarize. You can't go get some other thing. So I will grade you lower if nothing in your post reflects the way we talked about Plato in class. I will just grade you lower just because you didn't follow the directions without having to go you know, track it down and be confrontational. Um, so that's kind of the way I do it. Let's see, behavior. I've, you know, AUW students, I don't think they need to be talked down to about this. Um, please include how much time you spent preparing. Uh, the pledge thing is uh, something that you are required to do at Lion, but all that means is that you didn't plagiarize. So I think that's okay, I'm gonna keep it in because then literally you're signing something saying you didn't plagiarize. And so if you did and you pledge, you know, you're not gonna get in legal trouble, but it's a really bad habit, right? As an adult, you can't start signing things that you know are false. So it is a good practice. Um, I enjoy talking to you. So I think that's important information that I will try to um, make time, you know, we'll try to find uh, appointment times for extra conferences. It'll probably get difficult if I have 50 students. If you want to meet in groups of three or something to just talk about the material, that's great. It's, you know, it's efficient, but sometimes, of course, you learn more that way, so. All right, so that's the section of the class on the syllabus. Um, let me go back to, this is how I plan to be able to do um, every class. This was what I was hoping I would be able to do that just didn't work out the first time. So here's the paradigm issue. So there are the ancient paradigm, Aristotle's view, um, and these are the, what are called religions, are also ancient, they value wisdom over um, knowledge. And this one is just the Western version of it, was the Greeks, the Greco-Roman. Um, and then the modern view is empiricist, scientific knowledge, empirical science, Locke, Mill, uh, Kant, the rationalists, number of different thinkers that many of them warned the Enlightenment thinkers about the fact that they're not going to be able to save the world. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 
uh, Freud, Jung, you know, they said, wait a sec, you're leaving something out. But still, the, ac the academy, the, I think the majority of academics are trained in empiricist thinking and sort of take it as the only possibility. So my class, again, includes uh, a much bigger picture of this and uh, critical thinking about um, scientific knowledge. All right, so ancient science, Aristotle valued that he was basically like an ecologist and the economic system. He, he saw everything as interconnected and that we're part of the system. We can understand it and we should live within the limits. The two greatest sins of human beings are pride and greed. Greed is usually um, driven by pride, like the belief that we can control nature rather than understand it. He thought of that as like the ultimate sin, whereas moderns think of it as the ultimate virtue. It's what God wants us to do. So you do need to know there were ideas of the good and of God and of justice and truth and virtue tied to each of these views and they disagree profoundly. So that is important. The economics was based on agriculture, so it was more cyclical. The same cycles every year, that's how you developed your wealth. Um, the goal is wisdom, our places to understand. Authority is natural. Some people do uh, have more natural ability than others. Some people are wiser than others, but those people should use their ability to help other people, right? Just saying that you have more smarts doesn't mean you can use them to exploit people, right? It just says you have more potential to be good or evil, actually. Um, your identity is connected to your family. Now, the thing about this is for my students, how many of you still live sort of in the ancient paradigm when you're at home? Um, and I asked my students that at Lyon too. To what extent is your home life, your village life, much more traditional in this sense? Um, and then the modern view, right? Science, science is a system of laws or scientific methods. So the laws is the, is the dualist, the Kant, rationalists. Scientific method is the empiricists. Um, economics is industry and then technology computer science and new knowledge. You're always focusing on new knowledge and on progress and everything and every day and every way things are getting better and better. There's a value on equality and freedom. These are become the ultimate values. Individuality, everybody's an individual rather than getting your identity in a group, in a family or a history. Um, okay. There's a min, you know, you don't emphasize inherited wealth because that creates this entrenched elite. You want everyone to have opportunity and everyone to be equally, to have equal access to the resources to be able to flourish. And then they separated church and state. Um, today we have systems thinking. So today we've changed the science to um, the ecosphere, the biosphere the quantum leaps in complexity. So there's evolution in that change. Um, the, and so the systems thinking, the what we're going to read of it says that it has, today we, have, we should have the same basic values that the major religions have. And so a lot of systems thinkers who are scientists are going back to the wisdom of the ancients and incorporating that into a worldview. Um, all right, then the, okay, so the systems thought, the values in it, sustainable economics, culture integrated with nature, use technology to get facts, but to develop a sustainable way of life, avoid destroying nature, think about future generations, have wisdom about our place in the universe, um, 
let's see, we do have to change, but that's because we've been exploiting nature. So we do have to go through radical change, but to get back to something more sustainable. All right, so that's the paradigm issue. Then um, we're gonna go to Aristotle's virtues. And I talked about this quite a bit last time. Um, okay. All right, so we're back. I'm coming back after a pause. And we're going to go over Aristotle's virtues here. Um, so I call these the classical virtues. They are not true because Aristotle said so. Aristotle said so because he noticed these patterns in the human condition. Um, it's not just Aristotle, though. A lot of things were going on in the culture Aristotle was born into that were already based on this view. So he didn't, he's just sort of articulating what the Greeks and Greek culture already was very aware of. So the other reason I would say it's Aristotle is that he had a very terrible um, attitude toward women. So I do think, you know, I don't worship Aristotle. The, it's a good lesson in people grow up getting habituated a certain way and they are truly blind to what really should be right in front of their face. How is it they didn't notice? Well, the power of conditioning for one thing, but really Aristotle is culpable for that. He should have, he should have paid more attention. Anyway, so his model is, the goal is translated, the word eudaimonia is translated happiness. It's a very terrible translation because of utilitarianism, the way utilitarianism co-opted that word in English and made it into something very different. But what he says is people are not born virtuous or vicious but they're born with a natural capacity to understand the world and they are not going to flourish as members of the species. Aristotle's looking at human beings like a biologist looks at a species. This particular species has to be driven by the desire to understand. Uh, a flourishing member of the species recognizes patterns and makes choices based on uh, what should be intuitively obvious about which choice is better, but also reinforced through experience, through history. There are better and worse choices that lead to more or less flourishing, both for the person making the choices and for everybody around them and for people who come after them. Um, we're born with the capacity to develop the virtues. Um, and there's no such thing as not developing your character. So every day from when you're born, how you act, how you're treated, uh, emotions, behaviors, thoughts, everything is molding who you become. There's no neutral time off from character development. Character development takes place constantly. It's just that at a certain point, which I think is college particularly, is when you become a lot more aware of the power of your own agency, right? You have choices. You don't have to do it the way it was done for you growing up. So children learn by imitating other people by custom, what's customary, what's habitual in their particular context. But then at a certain point, they understand that not everybody does it that way and, and there are alternatives. So they have to start thinking, right? They have to examine the habits they were born into. 
Did my parents deal with these virtues or vices? Which ones did they, did they habituate me well about? And which ones was, were their weaknesses? And they led to my weaknesses. So nobody gets it right completely, but there's all sorts of imbalances. But um, you, you are capable of making that transition in college from living according to habit and custom to living according to reason. Okay, and the power of your mind. Let's see. Every one of the virtues is, everyone is has the capacity to exercise that virtue, um, but sometimes they might not exercise it because they basically have the vice that's related to it. Sometimes their life experience doesn't really kick that particular virtue, doesn't require the activation of that particular virtue. But for the most part, everybody does all of them to some extent at some point in life and for many of them all the time in their lives. So the thing about Aristotle I like is that it just systematizes and it just explains in a systematic order all the things that we all do each day anyway. And so we can all of a sudden realize, oh, this isn't just a crapshoot. This isn't just one thing after another, you know, different strokes for different folks. There's actually patterns there and they're all interconnected naturally. They naturally relate to each other. So. Um, so the most basic ones are related to our survival instinct. They're the ones we have in common with the animals. And those are pleasure and fear. So the pleasure that comes from eating when we're hungry, drinking when we're thirsty, and sex are um, virtues uh, we share with animals. And then courage is the ability to respond to situations of fear. And lots of times the response is violence, right? To protect yourself because you feel threatened. So animals have those feelings of fear and reacting violently. And they have that pleasure, right? They seek sex, you can tell. So it must be pretty pleasant. And they, of course, spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to fill their bellies and how to get enough water. Now, the thing about humans is on the one hand, we, the Greeks, we are by nature, the rational animal or the animal who has to live by the power of their mind. But we certainly do not behave as if we're very rational um, because we go to such extremes. There aren't very many animals in the wild who become obese or anorexic or um, kill members of their own species based on some idea. Animals don't behave based on some fear of life after death. There's all sorts of crazy things that human beings do that animals would never do. Um, uh, birds don't foul their own nest, <laughs> right? So a bird's nest would never look like a lot of college students' rooms <laughs> that are just uh, not livable, right? They're just so full of stuff and they're so disorganized, right? So birds could teach, teach college students something about how to take care of your house, your nest. Anyway, so that's because we have to learn everything and we have to have reasons for everything. Because we have to learn it, we have to ask why, what, what are we gonna do and why, and we have to give an account. We have to explain ourselves, explain our behavior to ourselves and to other people. Okay, so with eating, you can eat too much or too little. You can eat for the wrong reason in the wrong way at the wrong time. This is common sense. Some people need more calories than others. Uh, we need combination of proteins, amino acids, blah, blah. We've all got that. But in America, for example, the culture, the, what 
kids learn through imitation and habit is literally destroying their health. And children now in the US, first time ever, the overall lifespan has gone down for human beings. Well, that's because of all of our terrible habits. Um, over half, probably two thirds of the US healthcare system are problems that created just by bad habits or by taking sports so seriously that high school kids, college kids get all sorts of injuries just because they are so specialized and so aggressive in their um, sport, team sports behavior. Um, drinking, that can mean just water, of course, but it also means alcohol and um, you can drink too much, too little. Uh, Muslims don't drink any. And then um, I personally don't drink alcohol because of its negative effect on the political, on political, social and political life. So for me, a lot of my behavior is related to, uh, it's not because I couldn't hold my liquor, it's because other people can't. So about 7% of any given population has a genetic tendency toward alcoholism. Every person affects at least three other people pretty profoundly, either as a child, a sibling, a parent. Um, and so 28% of the population is profoundly negatively affected by alcoholism. And so that's why I don't drink. It has this terrible negative effect on the culture. Um, People disagree on how much drinking is too much. Um, so, and one of the, a number of what would be diagnosed as alcoholics don't think they're alcoholics, they're social drinkers. So the official notion of alcoholism is that you depend on it emotionally. You feel like you can't really relax. That, that is a dependency and that's one way of defining alcoholism, but a lot of people don't accept that, right? Because they do that and they don't wanna be thought of as an alcoholic. Um, anyway, so there's disagreements about how much is too much, about whether you have a problem. Um, eating, of course, we have lots of eating disorders and there are some disagreements about to what extent do you make the transition from just um, a person's way of life, the way they eat to actually a disorder. And then there are degrees of disorders, right? Anorexia um, is also has a physiological side. Your body starts responding in certain ways that make it then harder for you to correct for it. But all right, and then sex of course is huge because it's an incredibly powerful drive. And also because human children need about 15 years of stability. They need economic stability, emotional stability. They need habituation by mature adults and preferably their biological parents would be two of those mature adults who are just modeling the kind of self-control and the kind of virtuous behavior that children need to grow up and eventually affirm for themselves. So monogamy would be the ideal. The trouble is there are lots of people <clears throat> for one reason or another, either do not want to be monogamous or are really incapable of it. So they're abusive, they might be alcoholics, they might just be generally psychologically abusive, physically abusive, so there are lots of reasons why marriages um, don't last, which are better than just staying together for the principle of it. So the idea though is what, what sort of model should it be to enable a child to flourish the most? So if a child sees a, one of a, their parents abusing the other one, 
that's not good habituation. So now you have to choose between staying together or leaving and the child is neither one of those is the ideal, but people make decisions like this. What, what's the extreme, what's the mean? What's the best alternative among a, a couple of not ideal choices? So people disagree on monogamy, they disagree on premarital sex versus monogamous within marriage, they disagree on extramarital sex, they disagree, they disagree on everything. But always with Aristotle, what is it that can maximize flourishing, not just for the children, for everybody else? When people have multiple sex partners, oftentimes economically, they get in a hole because um, there's no steady income coming in from a, a certain one or two people that other people can depend on. So there's economic instability, there's emotional instability, um, there's too much disruption. So again, how much is too much? What are the alternatives? But that's what we talk about, think about, act on the basis of our ideas about all the time. Um, courage is the relation to fear. So. Obviously, there's fear of pain, there's fear of an early death in war, there's fear of aging and dying. Excess fear has always led to a negative relationship between the older generation and the younger generation, because it's always an issue in a society. How many resources do we use to keep old people alive when their bodies are trying to die? And you know, and you steal the resources, the money, the energy away from children and their education and their need to flourish and just give it to adults in the last year or two of their life? Or are there ways for adults to step back and let their bodies die so that the rest of the society can flourish? Um, and those are huge debates. The US is full of debates like that. Um, the, but human beings also have a fear of failing, especially in the economic system. They fail in the economic system, they don't survive. But failing to achieve various goals they had, failing to live up to the expectations of other people, um, they are afraid of loss of status. This is moral courage, standing up, speaking out against injustice or, or um, exposing the character traits of people in the public eye who have a reputation for virtue or who are not. There's all sorts of ways that you can lose your social status. You can be kicked out uh, from your friend groups <laughs> on Facebook, but on, you know, who you hang out with. And people are afraid of that and they will put up with injustices and all sorts of stuff. Um, injustices between other people, injustices toward yourself, just because you want to be part of the group. Uh, and that's a kind of moral cowardice. So um, there's just many, many dimensions of courage. Generosity, Aristotle thought was very important. It's translated liber liberality. And so what uh, Aristotle meant by a liberal society is one where people are generous. So he really thought it was important that everybody was middle class. And if you happen to make, everybody should make enough extra money so they can actually choose to give away some money because that's part of your dignity is that you can figure out how, how you think to best help other people and then support that. It's barbaric, it's less civilized when people can barely make enough just to provide for their own needs. So when you're creating middle class, you need to have some extra resources for everybody to get a chance to be generous. And then you need to reinforce that and honor that. Okay, magnanimity is if you have a lot of money. So this is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation all those foundations, NGOs. So a lot of you in your countries 
have benefited from the presence of NGOs or the World Bank or the Gates Foundation. AUW benefits from the Gates Foundation, and the World Bank. And that is when very wealthy people decide to give back for the, for, to enable human flourishing. Um, even temperedness is situation involving anger. Anger is a secondary emotion. Uh, it's underneath the anger is fear. So people often won't admit it, but I think a lot of the anger in my country um, is because people are afraid of the future. They do not know how they're gonna provide for themselves. And they definitely don't know how to have the same standard of living that their grandparents had or their parents had. And again, 55 years ago, I knew that this was going to happen. I knew, a high school kid knew. Um, because after World War II, the US, that Europe had collapsed economically and the developing countries were not yet developing. So the US was going to have, they had two thirds of the world economy. So they had, you know, high salaries and unions and benefits and pensions and a uh, strong middle class. And they voted for Franklin Roosevelt to redistributed money and had much more socialist uh, sector. The, the piece of the economic pie in our country had more taxes and services, public services than it does now. So, um, so then the developing countries started developing and Europe came back economically. And so the US is not have, does not have the same percentage of the world economy. It's people, the unions have collapsed, the pensions have collapsed. And so people really are afraid. But what you see is anger and racism and all sorts of stuff. But I think underneath that is the sense of loss of status because you can't provide for your family and you're supposed to be a man and you're supposed to be able to do that. Um, and so I have, I have, I don't know if you, I have sympathy for that. Uh, some empathy too, because for a while, <laughs> I didn't know how I was going to provide for myself either. But um, if we would just be honest, and if the history teachers had just taught people that that was going to happen, and we will have to deal with it. But instead, you know, there's too many students that learn this history about America is number one, and the city on the hill, and we're exceptional and all that. So my point here is that people's ideas are driving all of this very uh, irrational behavior, violent behavior, angry behavior. Um, and that's why education is important. And that's why looking at historical contexts is really important. I knew 52 years ago, the environment would collapse. Right about the time that the US economy would collapse or be much different and a lot less affluent, people be a lot less affluent, unless the government compensated for that. So I knew all of this stuff was going to come together at about the same time. And it did. <laughs> and we had a choice and we ended up electing a strong man, uh, a tyrant, basically, who doesn't respect the rule of law and tells people what they want to hear and tells them that he can save them from this, which he can't and he doesn't want to. But you could predict this. A little kid from a small town in the US could figure that out 55 years ago. And that's why I think liberal arts education, studying history, studying philosophy, studying these things, is really important because it means that human history is not just one thing after another, it makes sense. There are patterns there and Greek tragedy, Greek mythology, um, the Oracle at Delphi, all these things reflect 
patterns, the behaviors of the gods and the behaviors of people are about patterns that the citizens can understand and they can learn from those patterns. Um, so that's just related to anger. There's so much anger in our country and there's a reason for it, but the reason is ignorance. And if we were wiser and more informed, we could avoid all the cultural poison that that puts out there into society. So rational ambition, you find out what you're good at, that you that's really meaningful to you, that you can give back and, and help others engaged in this particular kind of activity. Then you find out what credentials you need, what sort of experience, what sort of grad school to cultivate that professional life, and then you give back. So that's rational ambition. Rational pride is when people go over and above their job description or following the laws, and they do all sorts of things to draw people together for the sake of a higher quality of life. And that's really what makes life great. And so every institution will have an honor day and they will honor the people that went above and beyond, right? People who created a positive climate way beyond what they were hired and required to do. Um, and I think a lot of that goes on at AUW too. There's these little, you know, I don't know, coffee parties or just these little add-ons that go on and everybody sort of appreciates that. So that's something to honor people about. There's rational humor, not to avoid getting too serious because you, then you can get frustrated and fixated. You have to figure out what you can control, what you can't control and sort of let things go. Friendships are very important. And um, that's how you develop your mind is you read material, you can make sense out of it. You can even apply it in your imagination. But when you're talking to somebody, it's much more concrete and you can really apply it in your life or you can make much more subtle distinctions. For example, you decide, yeah, I wanna be generous, but I don't have any money, so I'm gonna volunteer. Okay, that's nice. But somebody, a friend, somebody you know, is going to maybe help you out with what are the options for volunteering and which one makes the most sense based on your interests. A lot of times, you know, we're not capable of figuring all that stuff out on our own. And friendships might help check us when we get too angry. All sorts of ways that if you have really good friends, you really can develop your mind at a much more sophisticated level. If you have bad friendships, and if these people distort reality, and they tell you you're overreacting when you're really not, or they tell you, you know, that you're not really capable of something when you really are, that is very damaging. So you could read all the stuff in the world, but if you trust the judgment of somebody else who has really got bad judgment, what you read just doesn't stick. It doesn't affect you. You turn away from it or you apply it in a different way or whatever. So friendships are important. Sociability is you put up with minor injustices. So you try not to be petty or small-minded. Um, try not to point out a flaw in a person or a mistake they made that really isn't that important. And sometimes, um, I've had students that are really perfectionists and some that can be a real detriment because they don't like getting criticized and the criticism might not necessarily be really good. It might be wrong or, but they get too upset about it, right? Well, I've thought, I've thought about that and here's my 10 reasons. Um, just like thinking that the person criticizing you has really no idea what goes on in your mind and just, you know, shrugging it off because 
you'll never be able to explain yourself. It'll just cause bad blood, bad karma. So that's sociability. As long as it doesn't ruin your reputation in any way, you just let it go. So truthfulness, knowing yourself, really, really important, really difficult, and just a constant process. So these are called the personal virtues. They're the ones that you engage in, in relationships with yourself, your inner dialogue of the soul with itself, but also people you know in contexts other than technically political contexts. You, um, it goes over, it goes before you think about yourself as a citizen living under laws and also outside of those particular networks. Um, okay, then the political virtues are the ones based on the rule of law and we all should be subject to the laws in the same way. So the economic sector of every society needs to be governed by law because otherwise greed will just cause money to stick to money. And, um, and a few people will really be crippled because they have too much and everybody else will be crippled because they have too little. So the business sector needs to be governed by the rule of law. The art of legislation, a good legislator knows how to make laws that will promote uh, a, a strong and stable middle class. They also need to set an example. They need to inspire other people to want to create a strong and stable middle class um, so that they provide incentives for people who do things that weave people together and disincentives, but you know, hopefully not too harsh because that again creates bad blood. So that's just an art. It just takes um, skill of thinking about specific laws or specific applications of the laws. So the laws have to do with the distribution of wealth, resources. Um, and there are there's natural resources, but there's also education is a resource, healthcare is a resource. So in the distribution of social wealth, people are unequal in their needs a lot of times. Um, not everybody needs a scholarship to get a PhD in math. <laughs> I don't need that. That would be a complete waste of money. But they might need a scholarship to study philosophy because they can't afford it, right? So, um, so that's making good judgments about who gets what, when, why, where, how, you know, all that sort of stuff. The next one is how to punish people who break the law um, and not too much, not too little for the right reason in the right way. And equity is the virtue of a judge or a jury that knows how to apply a law in a specific case. So if there's a law about uh, murder, whatever, and then you have this case and you have to deliberate. You have to think about, well, was it premeditated or was it just an act of passion? Or And so we have a lot of different levels of murder, first degree, second degree, third degree, all sorts of stuff uh, to try and acknowledge the situation, circumstances. Then practical wisdom is this constant process. We have to make a decision about this, whatever it is, happens all the time, all day, you're making decisions. Okay, the, the ultimate object of wish is maximizing human flourishing. Then you know you have to figure out what options are possible. Then you have to figure out which option is best and why. And then you have to sort of persuade other people to agree with you and to be inspired by you to actually do what they need to do to achieve this goal. Um, for example, everybody wants world peace, right? But that's what the next question is, well, does that mean you take an environmental ethics class or does it mean you take a, a developmental whatever, um, economic development class? I mean, <laughs> it's some of those goals are so far away from the actual decisions that you make that they're not very helpful. 
So usually when you're deliberating, you think of actual options that you have right now and that would make somewhat of a difference, maybe more of a difference, less of a difference if you choose one or the other. That's the process of deliberation. Uh, we also have these capacities to create artifacts. We can create shoes and tables and all the stuff that we make. Plus we create poetry and books and these cultural products. So all of those can be evaluated according to whether they cultivate the mind, the, our capacity to flourish based on the use of our mind. And so in the Greeks, the poets were trying to educate people about how to live. So they really were activating the mind and teaching people about life. And then for example, a shoemaker, any of those skills that you have, including the skill of writing a tragedy, a play, can be corrupted if what you really care about is money or status or power um, or pleasure. So for example, a shoemaker can make shoes that are good for your feet and keep people healthy, keep their backs at the best possible angle. Although standing erect like that is natural, but to the extent possible, or they can make these high heel shoes that are really bad for you they, my mother and mother-in-law both had foot surgery and they didn't even wear very high heels. So they can make shoes that will cripple your feet, which just seems odd for a shoemaker, right? But it makes money, right? Why would they do it? Because it makes money or because it gives them status um, or power over other shoemakers to sort of control the market. Um, so any of those can be driven by a virtuous character or a wicked character. And then the intellectual virtues, this is the stereotype about what you learn in school, math, science, social science. You learn these methods where it's all objective, the detached observer, I'm just doing research. I don't, I don't bring values into it. I just, as a matter of fact, what are these people doing and blah. What do they say is the reason? Now, when I look at the curriculum at AUW, I can tell there's an agenda. There are a set of values there, which promoting women's empowerment, but technically these techniques were established at a time when the underlying philosophy was, there is a complete split between facts and values. And so, there are plenty of people learning engineering that are their motive is to do sustainable engineering. But there's other people who are learning engineering and their goal is just to make as much money as possible, which is more likely to create fossil fuel engineering, right? To lead to more carbon emissions because that's where the money is. That's where the oil companies will pay them a lot of money to get a better method for getting oil out of the earth. And, you know, we all die. But that originally, it was value neutral. You can't tell me, uh, you know, that I'm evil because I'm just a very good engineer. So Aristotle was very aware of that. The Greeks were very aware of that. Many of the characters in their tragedies in Homer were really smart and their smarts gave them the power to be either good or evil. And most of them are evil <laughs> because the stories are trying to, to tell those people who are smart, just to remind them, do not abuse your power of intelligence because look at all the suffering it causes and it even causes you to suffer in the end. So they're trying to get you not to want to do that. But if you're smart, you can be tempted. Um, so for the second day of class, um, let's see. So that's Aristotle's virtues. All right. Now we talked, I don't even know if we got to this, but I want to bring it up a little bit. I did mention that the United Nations UNESCO now has a curriculum to teach children um, 
a sustainable way of life from when they're young. So the United Nations, I wish it was more influential in my country than it is. Uh, my country started the UN, but it also tends to be the country that ignores the UN more than any other country, especially when it comes to war issues, environmental issues. And we will study some of that history. It's really shameful. We're the ones that Donald Trump rejected the Paris Accord. After all, probably every one of your countries signed on to the Paris Accord. And the trouble is because we have all this fossil fuel technology, we are the ones making it much harder for developing countries to develop green technology or to get the price to come down enough so that they can afford it. And so they get forced to make these um, contracts with fossil fuel billionaires and companies because they can't, they have enough poor people that they can't turn down jobs and money so, so these developing countries get put into a really bad situation where they, they definitely accept climate change. They definitely want to reduce their footprint, but mostly because of the U, uh, US, they can't find enough green energy products at a good enough price to be able to make that feasible. But that will change, Biden is, completely on board with this, but the US Senate is, the Republicans are not because their funding for their campaigns, a huge chunk of it comes from fossil fuel billionaires. This is just a fact about the US. None of my students at Lyon even know this. Americans are ignorant about it. It really annoys me, <laughs> um, but that, I will, we'll talk about that just so you know that information. So this is the UN declaration and it focuses on rights, the notion of human rights. It doesn't have the right to a positive uh, environment, but there have been documents coming out more recently that call that a universal human right. Um, and the UN is working on that. Then the other thing um, that happened related to the UN was this development of what's called capabilities. So instead of evaluating each country according to whether it provides rights, what they do is they say, does it provide the opportunity for people to actually engage in these activities of soul which is, that's why this is very Aristotelian. Are people actually able to eat healthy food? You know, yeah, people have a right to food, right? But that's very abstract. When you're actually gauging it, you're actually looking at capabilities. How many people are eating? Are they eating healthy food? Is the food close enough to them that they can get to it? I mean, all those particular details. Um, so these are all the being able to do this having the opportunity to do this. Uh, the other thing is you can provide an opportunity and people won't pick it. Um, if women are conditioned to believe that they're inferior and they shouldn't get higher education, they could be offered a higher education and they won't choose it, right? So there's that. And uh, the UN doesn't want to impose these things, but as climate change gets worse, usually, most developing countries, the UN doesn't need to force them. They want to, it's just that economically, they're not capable. Um, but I guess now that is somewhat changing because the president of Brazil has come out resisting um, any sort of environmental protections and an environmental attitude toward the cutting down of the Amazon and, and other resources in Brazil. There has been this reaction led by Trump of just deliberately undermining the natural environment. And so the UN, I just do not know what's gonna happen in terms of how much the UN has the power to force behavior, to threaten, to, um, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> They provide guidelines. The, the real forte of the UN 
is that they will, for example, have a set of guidelines for a nursing program. Here's the classes that need to be taught in this order. And so when I had a Fulbright, a woman was given a Fulbright to run the nursing program in Indonesia. And so she would take that curriculum and, and install it, instigate it, integrate it with what Indonesia had. So there's a standardized view. So then you can have nurses and healthcare workers moving from one country to another, and they're all on the same page. That's excellent. Like we definitely need the UN. We need an organization to do all sorts of stuff like that. The other thing they do is they provide money for what are called world historical sites. So some countries are too poor to be able to preserve some of these sites, and yet the world needs them because they made such a fundamental difference to human history. And then they also have some natural sites. So uh, preserving the Victoria Falls, some of the African countries have some really, really special natural um, sites, but the countries are so poor they can't afford to sort of keep them up or to prevent them from getting exploited for money. And so the UN will protect that area. Greece has a number of those because Greece is not a wealthy country, but like the site where the Olympics was held is a UNESCO World Historical Site and Delphi and uh, a number of them, obviously. But there's just a lot of them. There's so many things the UN does that is that are so wonderful. But in our newspapers, it's hardly ever covered. And there's always the emphasis of the UN trying to, to get at the level of power politics and, and the Security Council deciding whether you know, Syria should get invaded or something. And the US is just so belligerent. They will not pay attention. They just do whatever they want to do militarily, which is very annoying to me. But just to let you know, I don't know again how much, I think you know a lot about the UN because it is active in your countries, but that's definitely something I want to learn more about from you. And um, anyway, what I know is the difference between the rights and the capabilities, and that the UN looks more at capabilities um, when it's deciding if a country is being governed well and using the resources it has to promote the well being of its people. Let's see. I think that's enough. And that's a long presentation. I hope that that helps you make sense out of things. Um, the second class, I will post it. If, if I have all the readings, I will post it within an hour. What happened was I uh, scanned, I very, very carefully minimized the number of pages my students would have to read at AUW and I scanned it and I really got into this because I wanted them to keep focused on the main ideas. But then COVID hit and I, I had food poisoning. So I was still in my apartment and I had to leave and I left all those notebooks with all those scanned documents at AUW. And so it might be the case that I'm gonna have to redo this in which case that will take a little longer. Um, so, you know, I, I will have it done in the next few hours, but not in the next hour. Um, yeah, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> but the best laid plans and all that wonderful stuff, you, all of you are much more resilient, resistant, persistent, I don't have as many obstacles as you do, so I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining why there's a choice between one hour and three hours. What time is it? Four or even four hours. Um, I want, I think I'm going to be able to see my grandkids a little bit between then. And so I do want to kind of do that.
but I'll make sure you get it um, within what? 24 hours of when the class is. So I hope you hadn't planned on reading it more than 24 hours ahead. If you did, more power to you, and I'll try to get it on more than 24 hours ahead next time. Okay, I look forward to what you say, and I, for one, am going to learn a lot from all of you, and I hope that what you learn from me is something that you think you can take with you and that you think was worthwhile. That's, yeah, and in the evaluations or actually in conferences, you can let me know because I, I wanna educate the students that I have for what they need to know. Okay, thanks.